right, so now uh, let's get on to the show here in the Disruptor Studio. As you know, we feature innovators and leaders that are, that are driving just fundamental change in their business and their community. Um, and you know, what I love about Disruptor Studio is I get to blend my personal passions with uh, with you know, some just business transformation and innovation. And uh, our next guest is, is no exception to that. And I, I kind of came across, like many, uh, for those here in Atlanta, you know, you visit, you know, I think JCT Kitchen was my first experience where I just kind of fell in love with the place. And then, uh, this was many years ago, the next thing I know, I came across The Optimist, and then The El Felix, and there was this consistency to it, yet they were also unique. And there was just this magic that I think happens with those restaurants. And then as I started learning about uh, Ford's story, I realized beyond being an incredible chef, we have an, uh, just, a, a just incredible inspirational entrepreneur behind it that makes, the, makes magical experiences for everyone. So he has, look, he, his, his, he has uh, won many awards. The Optimist, as many of you know, um, was, uh, was rated best restaurant in the country and one of the best in the world. Um, he uh, has won awards from the Georgia Restaurant Association, the James Beard Foundation. He's cooked at the James Beard House. I could go on and on and on. You've probably seen him in one of your favorite morning shows, uh, cooking as well, too. So it is with great pleasure to welcome to the Disruptor Studio, Ford Fry. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, Ford, thanks for coming to the Disruptor Studio. Thanks for having me. No problem. I think the biggest complaint I had was it wasn't like a dinner time session or something like <laughs> yeah, that. I'm exactly. like, well, I can't do anything. It was on stage. Um, look, I, I think so many people in the audience obviously uh, know you and, and you're, you're very well known uh, around Atlanta. But if someone from Alaska who does not have a Ford Bride restaurant yet um, or someplace and they do not, not know you or your restaurants, how do you describe kind of who you are and the business you're in and, and, and really what are the brands you, you have out there? Yeah, uh, I think a lot of people even in Atlanta may not even know really who I am and what uh, I kind of set out to do. Um, it's a very, I'm kind of humble. I try to stay out of the uh, light as much as I can, but that's hard. But um, you know what I did is I said, I didn't know what I was uh, really setting out to do when I opened my first restaurant. I knew. I knew I was never complacent with just one thing. I always, my mind, I'm a, kind of a dreamer, so I always want to move on. But um, I guess a good bit into JCT, I worked JCT for about five years, so JCT was my first restaurant. Um, and I got to a point where I was thinking and dreaming, like what happens to chefs when they get old, you know? And, uh, <laughs> and because you work so hard uh, to get to where you're at, and then all of a sudden you just kind of fall off the cliff, or you go sell meat or canned tomatoes <laughs> for somebody, and I was like, "That's so wrong," you know what I mean? So, so really, my passion was providing uh, the infrastructure or space or ability for a local or a younger chef to um, do their thing that they may not have uh, the resources or whatever knowledge to do. Uh, so that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to help that, and I wanted each restaurant to be uh, an extension of them, you know, and I just wanted to help them and teach them. So that's what we built. So we built basically a, a list of restaurants that are supported by a corporate office, but you could say, you know what I mean, Without, as opposed to a restaurant group uh, that is that delegates what to do, what to cook. So to me, it's, it's straight up, um, uh, what's the word for it, uh, just empowerment. Right. Um, and that's, that's what it is. Every restaurant is its own. I want it to be, I want, it, I want the chef to be the personality of that restaurant, and I want people to know about that, and that's difficult to get that out, but that's, yeah. who, it, that's who I am. And right now, uh, how many restaurants do you have? Uh, 13, 13, almost 15. We have two in the works uh, in Houston, where I grew up. And you're here in Atlanta, you're in Houston, you're, uh, I believe, in North Carolina, you have one, or in, and uh, looking at Tennessee as well? Charlotte, yeah, yeah. Nashville's under construction. Um, so it's quite, quite, the, quite the growth. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. so to that, you know, I, I do want to kind of get back to what kind of started it all, truly, right? You know, but you, you mentioned something before. What does a chef do after they get, have this success? So what, what is this whole, there's a huge phenomenon now with celebrity chefs. So what do you think is driving that? And do you see yourself, you know, starring your own show in Food Network? <laughs> well, 
Why don't I? No, I stay away. From, I, I told my wife a long time ago, okay, if I ever get to a point, and this was early on, where I'm asked to be on a show, tell me no. Tell me I can't do it. <laughs> and uh, because I see what happens to people. And I've gone to her three times, you know, can I do it? Can I do it? But this time's different, please. You know, and she's like, no. I'm like, okay. <laughs> so that's, uh, and I think it's still a good call. But I think the select, like, the, Celebrity thing, it wasn't when I got into it, um, and I'd love to talk about kind of the minds of a, of a chef and really that we're just a bunch of derelicts, you know, who <laughs> who kind of worked their way through life, but... Um, Someone just agreed or so, I don't know, yeah, it just heard a noise exactly. of like... <laughs> it, 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 uh, it wasn't, it was that we, chefs weren't that when I started, where they weren't into this celebrity status, so... Um, I have no clue. I mean, obviously TV shows and people are interested in everyone loves food. Um, and I know this is gonna sound a little bit weird or crude, but food is basically, I mean, eating food is almost like going to the bathroom. It's kind of the, you know, there's no celebrity poopers out there, you know? It's, it's, it's like, so, so it's, it's, a natural, it's a natural thing that, that we have to eat. But I think restaurants have become such an experience and such a, that's what's changed things, I think. You know, now just talking through it, so. Yeah, and so, and so then for you, it seems like you don't really want to get caught up in the celebrity of it. Is, what's, what's the, you know, what kind of, what, where does that grounding come from, I guess? Well, I, I mean, I'm always, a, I'm always looking around and I'm always learning from what other people do. And, I, and, I, and I've seen it and I've known people and I see what it happens to them and egos happen to people. And um, it seems like once that ego turns on, you are just a prime target for, uh, you have to be perfect or you're gonna, uh, and I am far from perfect, so I just like, all right, I'm gonna try to <laughs> lay low. Um, but it's also about my people. It's like, if I'm out there demanding all this, uh, you know, fame and whatever, uh, I, I, I think about my, my people and they're like, well, I really did this or I'm the one who's cooking this every day. I just didn't think that was fair, so that's Got it. really it. Well, we definitely want to get in. You have an incredible story about how you develop your people, which I think is also kind of an innovation itself in the industry. But, but let's go back a little bit too, though. You're, 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 you made Atlanta home, but you're, you're, you're a Texan. So mm -hmm. how was it, did you know when you were young Ford Fry that you loved cooking, or how did, how did, how did that all evolve? <laughs> all right, we're gonna, we're gonna go over time now, now that I get to tell this story. Um, so I grew up in Houston. Um, I went to, I guess my IQ was high, because uh, I got into school, it was basically the Westminster of Houston uh, private school. Uh, so it was basically kindergarten through eighth grade, I was a C student, because um, I never studied, never read, never did anything, but I always made Cs, didn't matter. So come high school, they called my parents, said, hey, Ford's probably not gonna make it in high school if he's still making Cs. So they booted me over to the public school next door, uh, and they said, okay, he's coming from St. John's, let's, let's uh, let's put him in IB classes because he must be smart. So I go into IB classes and I made C's. So they boot me out of IB classes to the regular classes, which were these temporary sheds out by the football field. Um, <laughs> and I made C's, okay? Um, you know, and all during high school, so, so you could tell how I was an, as an academic student. It, there just wasn't anything that interested me, but uh, I always loved restaurants and the experience of restaurants and going to restaurants. We traveled a lot. My grandparents took us on trips, and everything revolved around uh, eating in, in nice places. So, um, so at the time, chefs were, again, derelicts in the kitchen with cigarettes hanging out of their mouths, whatever, and that, I just wasn't in, that was just not on my mind at all. The star was the front of the house person, the person in the suit and whatever. I'm thinking, well, that's probably what I want to be. So I started off as a, as a um, in high school, I got con conned myself into a busboy job. And I was the worst busboy anyone could ever have, okay? All I wanted to do was be in there eating. So I think I got fired because... I probably didn't get fired, I probably just didn't show up. But what I was doing was I was hanging out in the dish pit, okay, where the food is coming back, and I was eating off the plates that were coming back. Okay, I don't do that anymore, I promise. <laughs> but I wanted to eat, you know? So then I'm like, okay, well maybe I don't wanna be a busboy, maybe I wanna be a server, okay? So then I was like a, I got a server job, and they'd give me a four table section, I'd go into work, I'd give away three tables and I'd only hold one table, and I would still mess that one table up. 
And it was really because I wanted to be sitting there eating. So then I just thought, okay, I'm just lost. I don't know what I want to do. I'm a terrible busboy, terrible waiter. Um, so I go off to college, join a fraternity, don't go to class, uh, still make C's, uh, possibly D's. Um, and then my dad and mom just said, I think it was my dad, but my mom's claiming it. She said there was this, this articles in the Wall Street Journal saying fast track careers. Um, by far not a fast track career for sure, because um, I made eight bucks an hour when I got out of culinary school. But I went to culinary school, school in Vermont, and at that point, it just clicked. It was like, I got it. I'm a, I'm a learner through, through doing, and I love food. And from then on, it was just, I was the top in my class. I was no longer a C student. I was an A-plus student right. um, because it was something I was interested in and passionate about. Now, you know, in that journey, you know, especially going to culinary school, was that as much about your passion for food? And I guess the question would be, when did the thought about wanting to be an entrepreneur start coming in? Did that come early in, in, in your life, or did that come later as you started going into the industry? I mean, I always, it did come later, but I always knew that was the end goal. Um, um, I always asked myself, everyone asked yourself, what would you do if money was not? I mean, I don't know anyone who hasn't asked themselves that question. Um, and I would be the one who I would, I love the whole big picture of, I'd love to come up with restaurant ideas because I'm always dreaming about restaurant ideas yeah. and things that I would be passionate about doing. And just by way of the kitchen, uh, you know, it was 20 plus years of cooking in a kitchen, maybe 25 years. Um, and then I kind of had this passion of, I, I, you know, when you have a backer who is in oil and gas and a family member, um, it's pretty easy, and I'm very fortunate that, that I can do uh, that part of the job, you know, which is amazing. It's just probably one of the, I mean, I still would do it. I would do it for free. Oh, wow. Well, well, now, now you don't have to worry about that, right? Yeah, so, exactly. Yeah. So, uh, first of all, before you went on, uh, started JCT Kitchen, um, you were a corporate chef. And so how, how, how did that how did that go? How did that keep inspire you to go to become an entrepreneur, or is that? Uh, I, I, you know, I was a, I was more of a before early. I was more fine dining chef uh, for my first half of my culinary career, and then got recruited to this thing called Eatsies. Which, when I went there, I was like, I remember my first couple of weeks. I'm like, what are you doing? You know, this is <laughs> I'm making 100 pounds of pasta salad every day. You know, and. Um, and I thought about leaving. I got some other job opportunities about getting back into what I was doing, and I just stuck with it. I had a son who was one, so I thought, you know, this may be good. You know, I was making a lot more money than I was in fine dining, and yeah. uh, I mean, it still wasn't a lot, but uh, I was learning a lot about the business. Yeah. So it was really kind of a combination between learning about running a business uh, and uh, maintaining being a good father to my son. Yeah. Um, and then it just got to the point, okay, we just got to a point where like it's, it's time for me to do my, and the kids got older and they were in things and I could break away and start my own thing. Gotcha. So that's what got it. And so that, that first thing, how did you get uh, to that point, to that idea and, 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 and make that leap? Uh, well, it started with, you know, not knowing, I had an idea in my head, a concept in my head uh, that I wanted and I was trying to find a location for that idea and it had to be this many square feet, it had to have a patio and had to have all this parking and no one, no, no developer knew my name. Uh, so two years of that was just like, I couldn't find anything. So um, it kind of, it just kind of clicked in my mind like I'm a dreamer, I always have all these different ideas. Let me just find a location that I felt was a good location and let's do what that location needs. What does the city need? What does that neighborhood need? What's the right fit? And that's what, where JCT came about which everyone told me that was a terrible location because it was around the back. But I remembered uh, Commune was the restaurant that opened there uh, first, and it was packed. So everyone says no one knows where it, no, I think they know where it was because Commune was packed. So I didn't buy that. Uh, any location study we did put that area of town, the west side, as a third tier location. It put up Peachtree, you know, prime location. So I'm like, that doesn't make sense. And you look at a map, I don't think we had Google Earth back then, but I would saw these cross streets and I saw accessibility and, and I'm like, no, I think it's a good location. So um, 
that's where JCT was born. Bacchanalia was there and Taqueria del Sol was there, so I thought I would go right up the middle. The very, you know, working with farmers and all that seemed intriguing to me, so that's where it started. Uh, I wasn't very nervous, but go ahead. Yeah, I was going to say, well, it had to, so you weren't very nervous. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, most of us, we were launching. Yeah, yeah. Matt, should you have been nervous? I should have been very nervous. And if anyone knows anything about accounting, this is what happened. Uh, we opened up and we were doing, we were basically uh, operating at break even level, um, pretty much. So we could write paychecks and all that. And then basically, after two months, uh, we got our AJC review, and it was a four star review at the time, four out of five. Um, and at that point, our sales jumped up a good $25,000 more a week or something like that. Um, but what happened in accounting, I, I wanted to learn every aspect. I was in the kitchen, but I also learned everything about payroll and accounting. I just didn't want to be a slave to anybody, so I, just in case I, I needed to do it. Um, so I, I don't know if it was me or whatever, but someone clicked a button, which was it made our bank account it wasn't debiting, I guess that's the word for it, from our bank account. It was, it was showing me that we were gaining cash. And I'm like, crushing it, you know what I mean? <laughs> um, this is good, you know? So I kind of relaxed. And, and, um, and then my accountant called. She said, Ford, I think you clicked something on your thing that it wasn't ever coming out of your account. All, every, all the, every check I was writing to any thing we were buying was never going out. So we were just banking. I'm thinking all right, home run here, you know? And it just went boom, right back down to like break even level. I'm like, okay, wow, you know? Yeah. Um, so I, sh but I think because of that, I was not nervous because I saw this money in there that wasn't there. Yeah. But then by that time, we started even getting busier and busier and got okay. So I, I guess I got lucky. So is there anything you would have, now that you look back and realize maybe I should have been nervous, is other than hitting the button on the accounting software, is there anything, or maybe you wouldn't want to do that if you had to do it again, is there anything you would have done differently during that startup? Because that's a big, if I think anybody's career, that's probably the biggest stop. That's really what launched everything. No, I don't think there was anything different. I mean, I think it was, uh, it, it worked out well. I mean, I knew I had to work a lot. I worked uh, six days, we were closed on Sunday, and I came in and ordered. Um, but I, I felt that it was, it was really key for me to do all that and learn all that, um, and, I think that was a gave me a good foundation and five years of working that like like in my mind I was ready like at two years to start opening more restaurants uh, but the economy was just kind of squirrely right then and but we kept going up for some reason um, so after five years we're like okay well we're obviously beating that so then it made it okay but it was a, it was a solid five years of me I mean, I was walking around, I was changing the volume levels, I was always, on the music, I was always changing the lighting, I was always looking for cleanliness, I was watching every single plate yeah. coming out of the kitchen. I was just, I just didn't want to let anybody down, so. So that, right. so that seems like you're just hardwired about creating an experience, and so when you think about creating experience for, for folks who visit your restaurants, when does it begin and end? You know, what, what's the holistic experience from a Ford Fry restaurant? Yeah, it definitely starts with the location and what that location in the city needs. Yeah. Um, then it kind of uh, plays into which chef is ready to be the chef of that one and what are their skills. And then we try to marry, marry those two together. Um, and how I do it, it starts with a um, basically a mood board. Um, Obviously, not being a C student, I wasn't, you know, it's not about words. I have a hard time getting the, the concept or the vision out of my mouth. I have to do it with pictures. So I basically get a bunch of pictures and put it all together, write a sample menu. Um, and then I get with Alvin, our uh, graphic designer, and he, he makes it a little bit better and look a little bit better. And then it's a package, and we look at this package, all right, what does this restaurant feel like? What does it look like? What is the price point? Um, what do the guests look like? And uh, a level of uh, casualness or, or, or whatever. And so it's that, what is the music? Um, so, I mean, that's really how it, how it plays out. And then everyone, you, every, then it gets farmed out to all the different people who help execute it. And then they've got that guideline to follow. And then I'm just the one just to kind of keep it on the track because a lot of people have their own ways and they want to impart their own thing. And then sometimes that happens and it just makes it even better. 
So where do you uh, start finding the inspiration uh, for? Because you call yourself a dreamer. Yeah. Uh, how do you inspire those dreams? Uh, you know, it's interesting. Uh, has anyone t read the book uh, The Strength Finder? Or uh, <laughs> okay. Well, I obviously didn't read the book. Um, <laughs> <laughs> like, why would I do that? So. I actually bought the book and took the test. And the te I thought I was a creative person. Um, I thought I was a creative. Yeah. And um, what it told me was, yes, I had some creative in there, but I was a maximizer. I was someone who took an idea and made it better was my, was my goal. So with a lot of it travel, um, different areas of the country. One thing I noticed about Atlanta was uh, it's cool is you have like some top restaurant people and then all the chefs kind of bleed out from them, but then they start doing kind of all the same thing. So it just becomes the same. So I really wanted to pull something that, you know, a spin off something I saw in New York or San Francisco or whatever, but done in, you know, inspired by the South or in, in a way. So, so we, like for the optimist, the optimist per se is, is Atlanta had, uh, at that time, oysters, you know, you could get oysters at Fontaine's, you know, and half the time you'd get sick. So um, <laughs> it just needed, we needed a non-corporate seafood restaurant. Uh, there was a lot of, where the manager was there in a coat and tie, and I'm like, you know, I'm not like that. I, want, I, want, I like when I go to a beach, go to the beach, I don't care that we're paying a ton of money for the seafood or the fish, um, but... I just want to be casual when I'm there, you know, hence the little putt-putt course and all that. I mean, it's just kind of like an ex overall as you're walking up, like what is the experience? How do you feel when you leave there? And I wanted our guests to feel like, you know, they didn't have to get all stuffy. They can get the highest quality food they can and kind of take them away from their daily life for at least a couple hours. How do you manage that tension then between, uh, you, you know, obviously your, your, your restaurants are extremely successful. Um, and but you, as, from the business perspective and looking at cash flow and all the economics, I'm sure there's a lot more people around you. How do you manage that tension of creatively and experientially, this is my vision, what we want to do with the economics of the business? Yeah, it's interesting because I'm, I've always been, because I, I think I work with both sides of my brain, luckily, I think people tell me that, and, and I'm able to see the business side, but I'm also able to see the creative side, so I can run right up the middle. So currently, the three leads in our company are me, uh, my CFO, who's my brother-in-law, our investor's younger brother, and uh, my old boss that I hired, uh, Toby, who is our COO. Basically, everyone reports to the COO, and then he reports to me. But it's, it's so interesting to watch how we react, like when a new opportunity comes available how we, we, uh, how we all interpret that. I interpret that, yes, let's do it. I'm gonna make this and it's gonna be cool. The CFO is like, whoa, 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 hold on, you know? The operator's like, how am I gonna achieve this? How am I gonna staff this? You know what I mean? Everyone's thinking the way they're thinking. So I'm the driver, yeah. you know, the CFO is the, you know, the conservative, you know, and then there's the manager who's like, how am I gonna execute Ford's vision yeah. here? So, but, I think because I can go up the middle uh, when it comes to, I've gotten to the point where through, that I can respect that. And I think that's important, you know. I, I you know, usually don't like being told no, but, but as over time, I, I've kind of understood and come to know that, all right, let me, let me listen and see. Because so far we haven't made any, I don't think we've made any mistakes yet. They've all been, I don't think we've had a losing month yet, so. Well, that's right. That's a, you, know, you know, I think we talked a little bit about this before, but you know, I asked you, you know, there's something, something like a 90% failure rate with yeah. restaurants, and you were like, well, oh, not me. <laughs> but, yeah, yeah. In a, in a non-egotistical way, of course. Yeah. yeah, it's interesting because, you know, you hear this, this uh, failure rate, and, but I watch, again, I'm a watcher, I'm, I'm watch and learn, and I see what people do, I'm like, yeah, that's not a good idea, you know? And I don't know why I see it, and maybe someone else doesn't see it, but I kind of talked to my kids about it, but we were driving down, and there was this strip center one time, and my kids were little, I'm like, watch this, you know? There was a Chinese restaurant, and it was in the back of this strip center. Terrible location, you know, there's other five Chinese restaurants around, and that Chinese restaurant went out of business. And then two weeks later, uh, another Chinese restaurant's coming in, but this one's a vegetarian Chinese restaurant. I'm like, okay, that's real stupid. You know what I mean? You just limited your 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 <laughs> your base. So so there, I think there's just a lot of common sense. So, if someone's gonna make that decision, then 
those are the ones that are contributing to this failure rate. Uh, so so, so it sounds just, like a few of the fundamental building steps that that vision for the red, that what this thing is about is where they fail. So they're almost failing before they even begin. Yeah, and I think also, uh, as chefs also, we're very creative and we want to express ourselves on the plate. Sometimes expressing ourselves on the plate is not uh, what our guests want, you know? So for, for me and what I try to teach is like, all right, number one, you've gotta be passionate about what you're putting on the plate. Number two, the guest has gotta be passionate about it. And you can't have one without the other. You can't just give in and say, well, I don't like this, but our guests like it, so I'm going to do it anyway. You've got to be passionate about it, no matter how much it sells. Yeah. It seems like this visionary drive in terms of, I know where we want to go, and we're going to take people along with us. You, you mentioned once, you, you actually I think it was in Houston, you were looking at some space that business-wise it made sense, but you actually had, yeah. had passed on that. It would be great for you to share. Yeah. I, I think it was a location that was by the Galleria uh, in Houston. And I knew as a kid, I hated going to the Galleria. I'm like, why do I want to go to that area? That's just like, you know, when you're around people like Cheesecake Factory and all these other places, and I just didn't want, I thought that was a brand association thing, right. but the numbers say, yes, you'd, we would be busy, but it wasn't who we are, you know? So I made the call to let's, let's go in the neighborhood I grew up in. There's more of a story there yeah. um, where we may do less in sales slightly, you know? But I felt that it's overall the brand vision. It was probably the best decision. It's that the authenticity just yeah. for everything you yeah. do. How do you how do you convey that to? I don't know how many employees you have now, but obviously, quite a few. How do you convey authenticity to for everybody for everybody to execute authenticity? Yeah. Uh, a lot of it is you know because I did spend a lot of time with the Ritz Carlton company and and. A lot of it is learning what you don't want to do going forward, where the Ritz-Carlton does a lot of great things, but there was a point in time where there was a lot of scripted words, and it just felt uh, not so real. Uh, so I'd always look at other places that were more teaching people to be genuine, and, and that's from the staff perspective, right. to be genuine, be yourself, but then you've also got to kind of pull them in certain ways because they'll say crazy things too. <laughs> but... Um, um, but it also starts with the restaurant itself. Uh, I've always told designers, you know, I use the word not to discredit Disney, but I just don't, and there's a place for that. But for a restaurant, I didn't never wanted to be Disney. I said, I don't want to be themey where it's something. And now I do want to be inspired by something themey, possibly. Yeah. But I wanted them to feel that versus see it and be all in your face. So, and I think that's more conservative. Uh, Classic. I've always been kind of the, if you remember, Polo used to be called just the Polo Shop um, when I was a kid. That's where I, you know, I just loved classic because it was like it just never went out of style. Right. At least I didn't think so. But, um, <laughs> um, you know, but, um, and that's how the restaurants, I always wanted them to be like that. Right. Let's talk, I think this really gets into you as a visionary, also as a leader. You know, you, you mentioned to me that you want your chefs to be entrepreneurs themselves. And I, I think I'd, I'd love for you to share your approach to how you really develop your talent, particularly your chefs. Yeah, um, that, I mean, it's difficult. I mean, I said that's the most difficult part of my job because some chefs, you know, you don't, they don't, a lot of them just don't, most of them don't come to the table with the business side of things. But when that light clicks off in their head and they understand it, um, then they get inspired by it. And, but, but it takes that light to click. Like, and a lot of times that's like throwing someone in, bringing someone from say Woodfire Grill, or Woodfire Grill, is that what it's called? Yeah. Um, and placing them in JCT that is just turn and burn is like, whoa, wait a minute, okay, you know? I, I've got to adjust how I think. Uh, and then a lot of it is teaching some of the P&L. Like my, my goal is, there's a lot of times where I, I never liked it when I would give my notice and uh, the my boss or owner or whatever would be angry with me and, and uh, like, wait a minute, I've just spent all this time on you and now you're going to leave. Well, I took that as like, okay, I'm just a tool, you know? And um, so I've always wanted to say, my biggest point of flattery is if a chef comes to me and says, hey, I want to start my own restaurant. I love your blessing. I love your support. I love to talk through things with you that's the biggest form of flattery and I would love for them to go do their own thing yeah. because that's our goal is to teach them to be able to run their own restaurant. Um, 
And the hardest ones to do that are the chefs because, yeah. the, you know, chefs want to maintain, they just want to be around the food and they want to express themselves on the plate. Now, do you tend to find chefs that are desiring to be entrepreneurs to come in or do you try to find someone who has some potential? Yeah, I think there's a little bit of that, but I think for the most part, I try to find chefs that kind of think and act like I do. So most, for the most part, temper is the one thing that comes into play. Like, how are you going to treat people? Yeah. Nothing bugs me more than if I treat someone one way or out of kindness, out of support, and then they turn around and treat their people opposite of that. Yeah. That sets me off more than anything. Like, hey, I have given this to you. I have treated you this way. I've given you grace on this and this. But, and you're going ahead and you're going to not give grace to this person? No. You know? So they learn real quick. So, that's, so you, you have a holistic approach to your talent. I mean, yeah, what, what, what's, what's uh, I guess in the restaurants too, after the chef, what's the most critical kind of hire you, you got to make? You know, what, who helps set the tone in the front of the house and so forth as well at yeah. the restaurants? I would say it's a balance of the front of the house. I mean, a lot of times we are very, definitely talent focused. So, so we like to place, understand their, their natural talents and understand that their weaknesses is they're going to have a hard time moving the needle on their weakness. So what I try to do is focus on, all right, where's their natural talent and how do we balance them with someone that complements their weakness? Mm -hmm. um, so at, at that point after the chef, then it just becomes this puzzle and putting it together, like how, how, how are we going to move this? Uh, and, and if we want to transfer someone, whether they're whether they've even um, achieved that level or, or been ability to transfer or not, they, their, their talent has to complement what's already there. So yeah. it's, it's a difficult shuffle. Um, and it's interesting because you have this, what you call corporate support coming, <laughs> yet you want to be very anti-corporate. In fact, you used to be, or maybe you are still, but you don't publicize it, but notably Rocket uh, Farms, mm -hmm. correct? So w why was it so important for you that you did not have a corporate name? I think at the point, like I never wanted, like sometimes I would look up a restaurant that was part of a restaurant group and you type in that restaurant online and then all of a sudden it redirects you to something something restaurant group and then there's all these spinning circles and da 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 da, -da and there's a, there's a Mexican place, there's a seafood place, there's all these different things. I'm like, okay, that's just not authentic to me. Yeah. Where by doing that, that's going against what I'm trying to do and what I'm trying to say is each place is its individual thing and has its individual personality and individual website, no matter that it costs a lot more money, you know? Yeah. Otherwise, it's just a little click and, you know. I mean, it's a, yeah. you know, I think people do that for, I mean, I guess there's different reasons and I guess it speaks to some people and works for some people, but it's just what, what I wanted to do. Yeah, I think it's, you know, I mentioned when we, when we first came on, uh, the, the restaurants I interacted with, when we first met, I said, well, you know, it's interesting, I went to, JCT Kitchen and the Optimus and then the El Felix. And it was afterwards I realized they were all your mm -hmm. restaurants. And you love that fact that yeah. people don't get know. connected to it but don't know, yet they kind of are drawn to it. Right. Is that, I guess, of the experience? Maybe that's anti business. I don't know. But, you know, there's places I like, we don't even, like everyone's saying, hey, why don't we put all the business cards of all the restaurants at every restaurant? I'm like, right. no, I don't want to do that. So. Now you have, uh, you know, I believe Super Rica in particular, you're, you're expanding into different, the brand itself. Right. So how are you going to manage this expansion of a brand yet maintain authenticity and then not do everything that you hate about, you know, corporate restaurants? Yeah, yeah. I mean, the good thing about that is that it's casual, that it's super yeah. casual. It's a uh, Tex-Mex is very, you go to any Tex-Mex restaurant and they all have the same thing. They just make it a little bit different. It's like a Chinese menu. You know, you have General Tso's chicken here and you got it there and there and there and there. Uh, and that's what's different about it. So for me, uh, so what we've done is kind of carved out, all right, who is this team who's going to grow this? And so we've kind of carved that out in those type, that mindset. So um, authentic authentic we want each one to be like every if you notice every super good they all have a different sign none of them look the same i mean there's elements that kind of tie in but it's kind of reinventing the wheel every time right got it so there seems like so much again driving having that vision that inspiration there's a quote from an article that said i'd rather inspire than manage so how, how what, what's what's your thoughts behind that, that i'm that a statement? terrible manager i'm 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 a uh i always want to make people happy i don't want to be the bad, bad guy. Uh, 
and I just want to, I don't know, inspire through uh, positive words and, uh, you know, which is tough because sometimes it's not, you know, but I know I have to do that. But um, I've always thought, like, you know, even when I was at the Ritz, I got these leadership awards and things like that. And I'm like, I just didn't feel like I was a good leader. Um, but it was more about my actions right. uh, and, 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 uh, than, than it was my strong stereotypical leadership and Having people, people then tend to follow you right. as a result. Right. So what is then the thing? It sounds like you, you allow a lot of room, but what's, what's kind of that, I don't know if the pet peeve is the right term, but the pet peeve or the thing that as a leader in your organization as you scale that gets you to have to engage and maybe be the bad guy? Oh, um, I guess out of fear that, that they are not, if, someone, if I feel like someone is not passionate anymore and is lacking inspiration, uh, then that's it. I mean, I, I have to step in at that point where um, that's all I want. I want them to, like, even to the point of like, hey, the menu is yours, you know? Yeah. What do you got? You know what I mean? What do you want to do with it? I'm not telling you to do anything, you know? Like, do what inspires you, you know? And then if they can't, act upon that, then there's another internal problem going on inside that's a bigger problem. They're probably yeah. just burnt or not sure what they want to do in their own place. And then I want to figure out what that is and maybe even help them because we've done that before. So. Yeah. So, so with that then, how do you yourself invest for your organization? How do you, you avoid complacency? Because obviously I've had tremendous, incredible success and you could become formulaic. How do you make sure, how do you keep yourself in check on that? Yeah, I think it's, I mean, I'm kind of getting there where it's tough. Like whenever we have lulls of development, um, which was good to have, like we had about a two year time where we said, hey, yeah, we'll sign some leases down the road, but we want to take that time and make sure that all the other restaurants were, are firing well and everyone was passionate and doing the right thing. Um, and now we're at the point where I was, I was starting to get where you're talking about. Yeah. and. So I think for me, it's just that ability to uh, constantly, I love change, you know, so it's not, it's not too difficult, but, um, and I'm always the one that wants to spend money, so I love going in and, and um, refreshing something before it gets tired, in my, I hope, you know. Right. Um, so a lot of that, I mean, I, I don't, I think it's more about keeping my mind engaged on something new mm -hmm. also stimulates me to go back and keep everything else fresh or bring everything up to another level. Got it. Now you're in a, I mean, well, any leadership role is, is a public role, but your role is magnifying. We talked about the you know, celebrity chefs and whether you want to be out there or not, people associate restaurants or yeah. bad parking because it's, it's Ford's fault because they're going to get a park, you know, whatever it is, everything's coming back to you. So how do, you, how do you balance, particularly in this, this world of social media now, how do you balance, you know, whether it's the positive being too extreme or the negative, how do you kind of manage all that public feedback that you get? Yeah, I mean, it's tough because a lot of people say, oh, I don't read that. I don't read that. That's just junk. Well, I read it because... I don't, I think, yes, I do think some of it is junk, you know, and you have to learn how, I've, I think I learned how to filter that. Yeah. Um, but for the most part, I'd say 90%, I try to take as, as real, it's someone's opinion, no matter what, no matter if they had a bad day or not, it's someone's opinion, and what can we do to, to better that? So, but I do take it personally. I take all wow. that stuff real personally, and it, it does, I mean, if anything sets me back, it's kind of that, And but then I'm always, I'm not someone to, to make excuses like, no, 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 this person's just out to get me or whatever. I try to put that on my mind, even though it's kind of there and I kind of understand sometimes possibly that could be it, you know, but I still don't know. Uh, so, so even if you had a hundred positive view, that one, that one, that one stands push out? me over. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, who, is there any, do you have a support system to help you? Does anybody tell you, just ignore that all? Well, for yeah, it? yeah. I mean, because with social media, you know, and social media plus three or four beers equals <laughs> let's go, you know what I mean? Um, but uh, so that's where, like, I've done something like that before, and 
someone texted me, Ford, you can't do that. I'm like, I just did. Sorry, you know what I mean? Um, yes, you have a pretty yeah. decent following on, on social media, yeah, so you get yeah, to talk to a lot of your fans. Well, social media is fun. It's like, uh, I say it's like fishing for catfish, you know? It's just like throwing it out there and just seeing like, all right, what's it going to do? What pictures, what time of day, what pictures resonate with people? You know, I, I, I take a picture, like I play guitar, so I'll take a picture of a guitar that I'm excited about, like one like. I'm like, okay. I'll take a picture of a food, some fried chicken, you know. So I'm kind of learning what people like and what they want to see. Um, you still react to the negative, oh, but, yeah. but you don't let it yeah, define I'll get, you necessarily. Uh, that doesn't happen too often on, uh, definitely on social media. I mean, I'll get like some, they're usually, those are the good ones too, because they're like a, they're like a direct message that'll come, say, hey, I didn't want to go to Yelp or whatever uh, to publicly do this, but I saw this, this, this. I'm like, wow, that is genuine for me. And then yeah. that person gets greased. They, I mean, just, I'm just so thankful for someone to tell me like that. Because right. that we take, so we, you know, we'll take that and, and run with it really well. So. Right. So it's interesting. You're really, you pay attention to the words oh, yeah. more than the rating or anything. It's that. Yeah, that, we have that a kind. system uh, that, that compiles all social media that's coming in and giving every restaurant a one to five star rating. And we, we maintain a, we try to maintain a certain average from their bonuses and so forth, no matter wow. what the, they're like, well, this review is BS or whatever. Well, everyone's got those, you know what I mean? But so we're gonna maintain these averages and so we, we, we see it every day. I get an email and it has all of them. Wow. So I get to read them. And again, it's that balance to maintain your vision, not react to everything, but yeah. still be true to you are, but there's always something to improve. Yeah, yeah. 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 So, um, you know, uh, before we wrap up here in a little bit, a uh, little bit of fun. So, who cooks at home? Did you get a break at home? You know, I don't cook at work that much. And is so, so, I really enjoy cooking at home. I mean, for a couple of reasons. Because I, I, if you're married to a chef, you'll understand that, that uh, working clean, like, you know, everyone says, I'll cook you clean. I'll clean you cook. I'm like, uh-uh. I said, I will cook and clean, and then you will cook and clean. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> uh, so, that's how we break it up. Um, <laughs> because I'm done cleaning by the time we're eating. So, um, but I do enjoy, I, I, I enjoy cooking at home. So um, that's kind of my time. And that's kind of what happens, I think, when you get old like me. So what's your, so what's your absolute, what's your favorite food or your go-to food? Uh, at home? Uh, yeah, yeah, at home or, or, or maybe even out. I'd say, you know, I love, you know, I, we were talking earlier back there that, um, when I travel, uh, eating, I eat out, you know, when I'm here, my wife always wants to go to our restaurants, and I'm like, okay. Uh, and then, uh, but if I do have a chance, you know, I love, I mean, just taquerias. I love, like, little hole-in-the-wall Asian places. I mean, everyone likes that. Um, it's just, because we didn't grow up with those flavors, it's just, like, big, right. uh, bold flavors. You know, I think over time, I'm definitely not a um, uh, tweezer guy, you know what I mean? I can respect some of the uh, restaurants that do a lot of food manipulation and things like that, but I'm just so far uh, p past that. I'm like, what's the point, you know, really where I would just want food to be really solid and really taste good. Um, so that's what I go for. Um, so now, now, if you were not a chef, what would you be? Well, I used to say professional tennis player because that's what I enjoyed as a kid. But lately, if I would have known, I probably wouldn't have been a chef if I would have known about uh, a developer. I love, I mean, I, I mean, just from where I'm at right now, um, I love going into places like Crock Street Market or anything that are old and cool and have like very, so much soul to them. Like, I would love to go in and do like, develop something like that and curate and then move on. Right. That'd be nice because then that way you don't have to like sit there and manage it. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but also nurtures is in that visionary drive within you and yeah. that and, uh, and it seems like the exper that experiential piece and I, which I guess gets back a little bit. You talked about you, you, you like your employees to be happy, that delighting yeah. people just, just in, your, in your DNA. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, that's out fantastic. So with that, if you were to um, 
Uh, I mean, just an incredible story, and it, you know, uh, going all the way back to with JCT Kitchen and so forth, and launching that. Although I love the, you know, I think that's advice I want to give people: just don't plug in your accounting software; you'll be, <laughs> you'll be good. But, um, but I'm sure every restaurant is like a new venture, um, obviously, for you. But if, if so, if someone comes up to you and says, you know, they're about to start a new job or a new business or whatever it could be, and you were to give them some words of advice to have that drive to succeed, what would it be? Um, you know, I think it was something that I learned and, and really resonated with. Um, this was before I read this, well, before I read The Strength Finder. Um, I def definitely listened to parts of this book called The E-Myth, uh, The Entrepreneurial Myth. And it talks about this lady who um, was told that her pies were great and she should open a business um, selling pies. But then she became a slave to her business. So, so what I learned, and I was sitting next to a guy, a chef from New York, when I was helping out uh, a dinner a long time ago, and he told me he was off, I think, Friday and Saturday nights. I'm like, how do you do that, you know? And I don't take off Friday and Saturday nights, but, but it was just the thought that he was able to do that. And what he said was, he says, you ha your business has to be big enough. So don't, don't your, your, your business model has to be big enough where you can separate yourself out from that. And that also ties into the e-myth, where you can separate yourself out. You don't get tied into making pies. You get tied into watching your business and growing your business, right. um, which that's probably the best advice I could ever have. Uh, there's plenty of small restaurants that just, it, restaurants take a lot of yeah. volume to succeed uh, or you just basically I, I use this phrase you bought yourself a job yeah. I mean and I guess if that's what you want that's fine if that's your goal right. then I would say go for it and go 100% but that just wasn't my goal I, I wanted to you know right so. You're very good well thank you for it and we do have some time here for uh, some uh, some Q&A so if uh, and then there is a microphone uh, I believe coming around so it, any questions for uh, for Ford? We have some back there. Hey Ford, um, you know, one second, uh, Grant. Uh, Grant Wayne Scott with the Metro Atlanta Chamber. We we talk about food culture in Atlanta and, and Metro and how it's really changed kind of the vibe of the city. And I know we talked about this one night at at Optimist, um, but. I want you to know and everybody in the room to know how much of a part of economic development you and your restaurants have played for us. Um, you know, we entertain a lot. You, you get a, some big company from out of town looking for a location here, um, and they want to see the food scene. They want to walk the belt line. They want to get a feel for, you know, what, what the north side of town and south side of town are like. And we take them to your restaurants, in particular Superica, um, walk the belt line, maybe grab a drink somewhere else, and end up at Superica and your short rib has literally sealed, I would say, probably 2,000 jobs for, for Atlanta. And I, and I say that kind of jokingly, but I'm really not. I mean, it is the quality of service, the quality of food, and companies from particularly overseas, we have a, a, a string of UK companies that now are here because of, of your restaurant. So it's not a question, it's a thank you, wow. and I want you to know how important you are to you know, our recruiting efforts and to the economy in general. Wow, thank you, thank you. <laughs> no, I didn't ask earlier, but the Optimist, obviously huge success, rated you know, best in the country at one point. How, that moment that you saw that, that you're the best restaurant in the United States, what, what was, I guess what did you do? Did you uh, go to the bar there at uh, the Optimist or, no. or how did you celebrate? No, 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 so I didn't find out. That was, uh, so we got Esquire Magazine and Bon Appetit Magazine and, um, Esquire back then was like real, real big. That was a great award. Right now, I think Bon Appetit is better. Um, but I remember we were eating at Barbudo uh, with our PR firm, me and uh, the chef from The Optimist, Adam at the time. Yeah. And we were sitting there. We knew we were on this list of 10 or so restaurants, but we didn't know we were one. Uh, and she's like, so we were having lunch, and that's when she told us we were number one. Yeah. And I'm like, all right, <laughs> that's pretty cool. Um, so that's it all we did. Any, did, it, did it, was it nice or did it change anything how you even operated uh, you know, the restaurant or was it just a nice reward and we're gonna it take didn't, advantage of it? Okay, and this goes back to this 
I know what fame happens to people. Yeah. It didn't change anything with me, but I think it changed it with someone else. Got it. Got it. And I'm like, oh. I mean, my, my word of advice was like, you're not there. It's not the end zone. This is the beginning. This right. is just that. So in my mind was like, we got to be better every day because we're going to be the, 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 the magnifying glass is going to be on us, which was true. You know, you win this award and the next thing you know, everyone comes out of the house and they go eat there. It wasn't the best restaurant. <laughs> right. Uh, you know, whatever, you know? <laughs> right. The so, standards all set and just get, yeah, you know, yeah, almost. Yeah. So stay humble, stay humble. And, uh, yeah. I love that. Stay humble. It was a great leadership moment. Uh, Mike. Hey, so I, I had a uh, two-part question. You answered the first one because one was going to be clarifying the pronunciation of Super Rica because I think about 20% of the Atlanta population has botched it over the last. Uh, so thank you for clarifying that. The second one was you talked uh, a big uh, success ingredient for you is obviously the empowerment of kind of the, the chef entrepreneurs that you put in place in each of your restaurants. Can you talk a little bit about just um, your relationship with them, how you kind of keep them motivated, how, how much is it hands off? I mean, you talked about the system of social media and some different things that kind of spur them, but um, can you talk just a little bit about how, how different that is, how intimate you are with the management of them and just kind of um, a little, yeah. how you kind of keep, keep, that, keep yeah. them driving for success? Yeah, yeah, for instance, um, you know, now that we're d d uh, building some stuff in, in uh, Nashville, um, there's some really cool restaurants in Nashville and people doing some things that really speak to the way I like to eat and cook. Um, so what I'll do is I'll come home and I'm like, we need to gather up a few chefs and we just need to road trip it. So we'll road trip, stay in Nashville, get an Airbnb or something like that and go hit some restaurants and then drive back. And that's really inspiring to chefs to, to, to be able to get out of town that they don't have to pay for and get, be able to eat uh, in that drives them they come back and they're like wow and then I get an email thank you so much for this this has inspired me to do this this and this you know and that's my best tactic so far what are your observations are you, you're working in Atlanta Charlotte Nashville Houston I mean, how do you think about the vibe and the culture of those cities versus Atlanta and what would you um, if you could export from those cities and bring to Atlanta that you think Atlanta's lacking uh, you know, I haven't got to, we haven't opened in Nashville yet. I haven't seen, I think Atlanta's great. Um, and I see it as one of our definitely flagship and will probably be a better city for us than any of the other ones other than maybe Houston. Um, Houston, I don't know so far that any of the ones that we're in necessarily would bring much to Atlanta, I would say. Uh, Houston has a great um, ethnic vibe and, and, and starting to blend, it would be blend, It would be like Atlanta blending Buford Highway in with uh, the restaurant scene, you know, so taking from Buford Highway and bringing them in, in a way of support, either supporting them, um, and this is starting, I think, in Atlanta, but maybe even it would be great if I could, you know, if we could even have like as opposed to having a guest chef dinner where you're flying some prima donna in that people know, let's go find some immigrant or someone and let's bring them in the restaurant and have them do their food uh, in our restaurants. And I think that would be fantastic. And I'm starting to see that in Houston, I would say, um, which would be really nice because I mean, I think that the, the foodie crowd has, has experienced Buford Highway and experienced the, the ethnic vibe and how, how amazing it is here. It'd be nice to be able to support them. Like we've done some things where there was a there was a woman, Gigi, who was a, a Katrina uh, victim who moved here, and she opened. She's kind of like this vegetarian Chinese restaurant type person, where she opened up way out in Woodstock in a bad place. I'm like Gigi, come on, you know. So I met her. Someone said, "Hey, can you go talk to her? She's struggling or whatever." So she makes these crawfish pies and things like that. So whenever we have like our optimist. Uh, anniversary party we try to bring her in and let her sell her pies so we buy all the ingredients and we we make we help her make everything and then she gets to sell them and take the money for it so uh more of that kind of stuff um i think could be really cool in atlanta so i'm a farmer and hey. you could say that i bought myself a job definitely yeah, <laughs> yeah for sure um, farming is full time it's 24 7. but what is your um favorite crop or what is the crop that you're looking for um, that you seem to not be able to find on the scale that you need in your environments. Yeah, uh, 
lettuces, you know. I don't, I'm not a big fan of um, hydroponic for sure. Um, I love uh, really beautiful greens that are sturdy, not, uh, you know, so I'm kind of learning like there's the, the first clipping or the second clipping or the third clipping. It always started with arugula for me. I couldn't get enough arugula and I told the chefs, I said, listen, I will fire you if I see you with this brand of arugula that's coming from California that doesn't taste like anything. But then what we start getting is like these early clippings of, of arugula that's really wilted and sometimes the salad gets tossed and it goes, you know, so I love hardier greens that have a lot of flavor to them. So, um, and you know, when I go to California or, you know, it could be, you know, the, the soil and, the, and the, the, the growing region and all that. And uh, you just see just really beautiful lettuces. I just don't ever want to buy California lettuces again. Yep. You know, if we're talking about with the, with the, with the local, supporting local farming, you, you started uh, many years ago the, your the, the, this festival mm. on tomatoes. So yeah. what, what, share a few minutes about, about, about that. What, what kind of inspired you to do that? Yeah, so who doesn't know, I've never heard of the Attack of the Killer Tomato Festival. Raise your hand. That's good, that's good. It's only taken 10 years. But, uh, so what happened, Attack of the Killer Tomato Festivals, I remember that movie as a kid, uh, terrible movie, but uh, it was funny in its own way. Um, but I remember our farmer, Nicholas, was coming to our door. It was probably our second year of opening at JCT, and he just said, I've got pallets of tomatoes, I cannot give them away. And I just felt for him because I saw how hard he worked. And uh, I'm like, all right, next year we got to do a festival, a fun festival um, that is celebrates the farmer. And it's the farmer's basically employee picnic by any, you know, uh, employee party uh, where we buy all their tomatoes. And I think we've gotten to a point where they actually, they've kind of got caught with their pants down the first year, but uh, now they've learned that they've got to grow for the tomato fest. Because um, Georgia tomatoes are just, during peak season, is so, or they're so fantastic. So we pretty much blow out all the tomatoes in Georgia from what I've heard. But um, So that's what really what the festival is. Usually a fun, crazy band is playing, and uh, there's just food everywhere and cocktails, tomato cocktails and tomato samples everywhere. They're very good. Well, Ford, uh, uh, so we're about out of time here, but I do want to thank you. I mean, it's, it's you've, uh, incredible visionary drive, and I love the story. I love how you uh, are just uh, obsessed in a very positive way about the experience you create. I think uh, so many insights that anybody in any industry could, could, really, could really apply, and just fascinating story about how you develop entrepreneurs uh, within your restaurant. So thank you for your time, and uh, we'll see you soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.